happening. Okay, so welcome everyone for the second session of today. Uh, just a couple of reminders. There is a code of conduct for this meeting. And if you have any problem, please don't hesitate to reach out for Elena Valenti or Dimitri Gadotti. Uh, for every invited questions, we will have five minutes of, sorry, invited talks. We'll have five minutes of questions by the end of the talk. You can either write here in the chat, you can raise your hand, and you can also write in Slack. Uh, Tutku started the thread for this invited talk for now. And just a reminder that we are recording every talk. So if you don't want to show up, uh, just don't turn on your camera. So we will start with the first invited speaker today, um, Melissa Ness. Melissa, you can share your screen. And when it's close to 20 minutes, I'll let you know, OK? Thank you. That sounds good. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much for having me today to talk about the 3D chemodynamical structure of the Milky Way bulge. And a big thank you to the organizers for recording all the talks and putting them online. Uh, they're just wonderful to watch. I've been enjoying that. There's been a lot of context already uh, presented in the talks preceding mine. So let me be very brief in saying that simulations predict that a bulge formed from the disk will be boxy or X-shaped. And we see this in a variety of different simulations. I'm just showing here an end body simulation, the face on edge on and side on view which forms a boxy or peanut bulge, a dissipation or collapse simulation in which we see a similar morphology. And we see this in cosmological simulations. Now, this is simply a consequence of orbit families from dynamical instabilities. Now we see this X shape in the Milky Way. This is beautifully revealed just in the wise photometry. This is just stellar light. And we have to take into account projection effects because the Milky Way bulge is about 27 degrees with respect to the line of sight. Now, this X-shaped structure in the Milky Way bulge is then indicative of bulge formation from the disk. And somewhere between 20 to 40% of the orbits in the bulge or models indicate that about 20 to 40% of orbits in the bulge contribute to this X-shaped structure. The X-shape itself underlies a central boxy peanut, which is the vertical extension of a longer flatter bar, which is something that is seen in both external galaxies and n-body models. And the long bar in the plane has been measured to extend to about five kiloparsec, but there is some debate about the connection to potential connection to spiral arms at that distance. There's now an analytical model available of the mass distribution for the bulge, which will come in very handy in the Gaia era for integrating orbits in the inner galaxy. Okay, so we've made, uh, there's a huge inventory of information and interpretations and analysis of the bulge to date. But I'm going to argue that we still need to observe more stars and build up a distribution of stellar ages, metallicities, individual abundances, and spatial positions. And of course, we're doing this with this ensuite or this suite of surveys that are both online and coming online in the next few years. Now, in addition to these large surveys, I think it's important that we observe stars in common between these surveys. And I'll lay out why I think that's important later in my talk. I also think that we need to be thinking not only about the big surveys, but really critically pre-selected metal pore surveys to get at the signatures at the few percent end of the metallicity distribution function. Now, the organization of dimensionality, when I think about the 3D chemodynamical structure, I think about the observational data, the chemical evolution modeling, the dynamical modeling, and the simulations. And all of these work together in concert in our interpretations. But my talk today will focus just really on the observational data. Now, the organization of dimensionality, the long version, is just a shout out to recognize the huge amount of effort and work that has gone into where we are today in our interpretations and understanding of the bulge. And this is just some recent work that I've highlighted, but I want to also bring uh, to your attention, a couple of really beautiful reviews that go into all of this work in much more detail. And of course, uh, much earlier work that has built up the legacy of uh, the bulge and the research in the bulge. The condensed version of what I'm presenting today is really the evidence that we think most of the bulge has formed from the disk. And this process has left an imprint in the relationship between the metallicity of bulge stars and their kinematics or their orbits. We're building models to trace this architectural process in detail. So we're building models to use the observed ages, 
metallicities, individual abundances, and spatial positions and densities of stars in the bulge to understand the formation of the bulge and its relationship and interac interaction with the disk. The metapore stars of the bulge are believed to be not disk material. And these are such an important population because we can understand if these are globular cluster remnants, if they're signatures of the first stars formed in the galaxy captured in this population, if they're halo stars or a discrete population from earliest collapse. Let me start with the metallicity distribution function of the broad of the of the bulge. Uh, and there's consensus between different groups that this is very broad. So let me show the Argos MDFs at three different latitudes, minus five, minus 7.5 and minus 10 degrees across longitudes of plus or minus 15 degrees. Okay, so here from left to right, increasing latitude from the plane, these three MDFs are these three different latitudes. And in this work, we fit three, five statistically significant components to the bulge. Other groups find a different number of components. That's not necessarily in significant conflict, as more importantly, these components are a tool to understand as you move fractionally at different heights from the plane, how does your metall metallicity distribution change? And you can quantify how much that changes at different metallicities with this sort of approach. So we can see, for example, as we increase in latitude in the Argos MDFs, our component A, the most metal rich component significantly decreases. Our component B stays around the same. Our component C increases and the most metal poor population only really appears uh, at, at higher latitudes from the plane. Okay, so this is more importantly, should be seen as a tool. Now we not only have iron abundances, but we also have, have alpha enhancements for stars in the bulge. And now I'm showing the Fe on H, alpha and Fe plane, the stars in the bulge. So this taps us into products of supernovae type 1a and supernovae type 2, which are two, two channels of enrichment that happen on a slow and fast time scale relatively. And I'm showing the three corresponding alpha ion planes for these three different latitudes for the MDFs below them. Okay, so if we want to understand where these different components lie in the alpha and Fe plane, component A, for example, is mostly the low alpha stars, but not exclusively. B and C, the high alpha stars in the inner region. But importantly, you'll notice as you go more metal poor in the high alpha sequence, the contribution fraction changes more significantly for the more metal poor in that component C compared to that component B. And components D and E there are really only appear at the highest latitudes. Now, if we then compare the bulge high and alpha plane to the disc, uh, we see some really interesting changes. So we saw in the bulge changes with latitude, and now we're looking at changes with radius. And you can see that at the solar neighborhood, both the high and the low alpha sequences are present. The high alpha sequence has a similar gradient in the sense of the gradient in the Fe alpha plane uh, at both the two different radii, but the low alpha sequence has this much flatter gradient near the sun and is much steeper in the inner region. And it also has a lower mean metallicity, whereas those high alpha stars retain the same metallicity regardless of their galactic radius. Okay, so this is the alpha ion plane is this beautiful and gives us this beautiful empirical landscape of the Milky Way disk moving into the bulge. And now I'm showing the same figures in the alpha and Fe plane, supernova 1a, supernova type 2, but broken up into bins of two kiloparsec in radius going from the bulge all the way to the outer disk at 17 kiloparsec, where these first two subpanels represent the bulge region. And what you can see is, okay, the inner region, you see this high and low alpha sequence. The high alpha sequence is really concentrated to the inner region. It's thicker spatially. It disappears by the time you're in the outer disk where we're just seeing that low alpha sequence. And the morphology of that low alpha sequence is really changing in a very interesting way from the inner to the outer region. But there's really this smooth transition in this characteristic mapping from the bulge into the disk. If we look now at maps, this is looking in the XY plane, the sun is at minus eight kiloparsec, the bulge is at zero, zero in XY, and dividing up into the low and the high alpha disk, you can see that the low alpha disk has this beautiful gradient, most metal rich in the inner region, going to more metal poor in the outer region, whereas the high alpha disk is chemically homogenous. And again, you can see it concentrated to the inner region. Now we know that we have ages for these stars, and in the solar neighborhood, the high alpha disk is old, 
and the lower for disk is young. And what's changing is with spectroscopic ages, which I'll talk about in a few slides, we're moving from being able to get ages just in the solar neighborhood to being able to get ages across the entire galaxy from the stellar spectra of red giant stars. So this will be, I think, an important next step in understanding the distribution of ages and the correlation between ages and an alpha enhancement. There's also evidence that the individual abundances of the disk and bulge are very similar. And recently a two process model has shown using a two process model, stars from the disk can be used to predict the bulge abundances. This is shown here, the x-axis is the magnesium to hydrogen, the y-axis is individual abundances with respect to magnesium, where magnesium is used as the denominator as it's a fairly uh, un, uh, unpolluted supernovae type two product. And the prediction and the data for each of these 16 elements is shown in each subpanel. Okay, the data is in large symbols, the model is in the small scatter. There's a prediction for every individual star in the bulge based on the disk measured abundances of magnesium and iron alone. And this works if you break up the data into a high alpha population in pink and a low alpha population in orange. And ultimately the conclusion is that the physics that determines the individual abundances does not depend on spatial location. Let's move now to kinematics. Okay, the kinematics is, enables us to really start testing this beautiful correlation between how stars are moving and their metallicities. And here, these different subpanels show the rotation at the top, dispersion down the bottom for different metallicity bins. And they're even more finely divided up than those components that I showed earlier. Moving from left to right, or moving from right to left is going to more metal poor stars, going all the way down to metallicities of minus two dex. And those components A and B that I showed earlier are taking up the first four of these columns. Okay, so we see that in the rotation, and then and in the dispersion, we see the dispersion shows a really obvious signature of increasing dispersion as you go to more metal poor stars. Let me first just consider stars with metallicities of greater than minus 0.5 dex. These stars show this characteristic cylindrical rotation profile and a dispersion profile that has this very latitude dependence triangular shape at low latitudes. This is showing this sort of triangular shape at latitudes of three degrees and a flatter dispersion profile at 10 degrees, which is shown in these different colors. If we look at these stars with metallicities of minus 0.5 dex at five degrees from the plane, these account for about 50% of bulge stars. So just look, looking at them on the MDF, this is where they live. And it turns out that only these stars appear to be part of the X-shaped structure. We can determine this because we can look at simply the star counts along the line of sight for standard candles like red clump stars for which we can get precision distances. And we can see that the stars split into the arms if you move high enough, high enough above the plane, but only the stars that split into the arms have metallicities of greater than minus 0.5 dex. So there's a bimodality in the red clump magnitude distribution that's seen for the metal rich stars, metallicities of greater than minus 0.5, but not so for the more metal poor end. So if we go back to our kinematic division, it appears that the evidence is pointing to these stars with metallicities of greater than minus 0.5 dex being part of the X shape. So what about these stars going all the way down to minus one dex between metallicity of minus 0.5 and minus one? They have slightly slower rotation and they have a dispersion profile now that is much less latitude dependent. We think these are stars that are also disk material and they may be a thick disk component that was present before the formation of the bulge from the bar or a, a product of kinematic fractionation from the disk. I wanna briefly explain this idea of kinematic fractionation. This is shown in a face on, edge on and unsharp mask view. This is basically where stars are redistributed into the bulge according to their initial radial velocities. So the initially radially hot populations will be redistributed into this thicker, weaker bar structure, whereas initially radially cooler populations will be redistributed into a thinner, more X-shaped structure. And this can explain uh, a number of the observational properties of the bulge. So these stars with metallicities of greater than minus one account for the majority of bulge stars. And the evidence seems to point to these stars being primarily disk material. 
Now, I think what we need to do moving forward is combine surveys and data sets to maximize our efforts. So surveys each measure temperature, gravity, so evolutionary state, as well as metallicities and individual abundances from stellar spectra. And in order to combine surveys for analysis, we need these numbers to be on the same scale. We can't have offsets for stars in common between surveys. In order to make sure they are on the same scale, data-driven label transfer approach approaches have been developed to directly cross-calibrate surveys, given stars in common between surveys. And this is enabling us to combine data across the galaxy and solving a long-standing problem, which was that the same stars observed in different surveys would have different temperatures, gravities, metallicities, individual abundances, and so forth. An example, a recent example I'll show is putting the Argos survey of 17,000 bulge stars on the apogee stellar parameter scale, uh, which is a more precise stellar parameter and abundance scale using stars in common between those surveys. And one of the benefits of the data-driven approach is it's enabled us to get spectroscopic ages using reference objects with precision ages for that data-driven label transfer. And we've known the age range in the bulge from individual stars from the work of Thomas Bensby, and we're able to take that to the next level with, with much larger samples. So how data-driven label transfer works to put two surveys on a common scale is it relies on stars in common between two different surveys at the different resolutions and wavelengths. And you simply take your high fidelity labels where your labels are your things like temperature, gravity, metallicity, iron enhanced, uh, you know, individual abundances, whatever labels you want to learn. And you make a model using the spectra from your survey B. And you can then use that model to put your survey B directly on your survey A scale. Again, there's a whole lot of work that's done this now. One of the regimes in which this is really going to be beneficial for bulge studies is that we're able to label low resolution survey data with individual abundances. And this has been done, for example, propagating the Galar individual abundances to low resolution Lamost survey data, which is this very large low resolution survey of primarily the outer disk and from getting stellar ages from stellar spectra. An example of putting the Argos survey on the apogee temperature, gravity, metallicity, and magnesium scale, which is the A2A survey of 38,000 stars, where Argos was resolution of 11,000, apogee's resolution of 22,000, so slightly, so has more higher precision temperature, gravity, iron, and magnesium that are propagated to that Argos survey. Moving from the MDFs, which I showed previously, is a function of galactic latitude with more stars, we can start to do deeper analyses. And this shows the in-plane slices at three different heights, showing the stars colored or the, the mean spatial distribution of the stars colored by their metallicity. And so not only can you look at the mean distribution of the metallicity distribution function of those different heights, but you can start to see that the mean metallicity changes as you move along the bar. The x-axis is the long axis of the bar and the y-axis in this figure is the short axis of the bar. And these sort of patterns that you see at a single slice in latitude or height from the plane are consistent with this process of kinematic fractionation of this separation of the initially radially different, popula radially, uh, different populations with different radial velocities by the bar. Okay, good. So I wanna, uh, wrap up with a couple of slides looking at first spectroscopic ages, which I think are going to be really critical moving forward. We can leverage the mass dependent dredge up, which changes the surface carbon to nitrogen abundances on the red giant branch. This shows in apogee, iron on the x-axis, carbon to nitrogen on the y-axis, 2000 stars that have been measured by Kepler are shown from which we can determine ages from astroseismology. There are now 6,000 stars that are so-called in the Applicast sample that have spectra from Apogee. We can get the stellar parameters, individual abundances, and ages from Kepler. So this subset of stars in Apogee can be used to build a data-driven model to label the rest of the Apogee spectra with ages, given this reference set of stars in common. And this has really enabled a regime change from having these small local samples to having stellar ages throughout the galaxy. Now, this shows a map where the sun is at eight kiloparsec on the x-axis, the galactic height from the plane is on the y-axis. And you can see there's this beautiful distribution of stars, old stars further away from the plane, young stars in the plane flaring. But this is primarily 
given us ages in the disk, we still only have a few thousand stars in the bulge, but that will be changing as we observe more stars in the inner region with current and future surveys. Melissa, I'm sorry, yep. uh, two minutes, please. Two minutes, okay, very good. Uh, we can also get precision distances from data-driven approaches. I just wanted to show this distance map uh, because pre previously we had to leverage red clump as standard candles. We can now get spectrophotometric distances for bright giants using the same data-driven approach. And this just shows the mean metallicity, so XY plane, the galactic center is at zero, zero, colored by mean metallicity, the rotation is shown, you can see the arrows point in the mean direction of the rotation. You can basically read where the bar is directly off this map. And so, and as also Gaia is of course uh, enabling much, uh, much new science in this area. Okay, so in studying the bulge, the other thing that I'd like to highlight is that outliers and metal pool populations are the next level. And there's a whole lot of beautiful talks uh, that I recommend watching on this regime. And this is really the 5% of bulge stars that you really need those targeted surveys to look at to determine are any of them disk, are they the halo population, a discrete bulge population, can we see signatures of early nuclear synthetic events. So in wrapping up, I think we've made such significant progress in understanding the inner galaxy in context. We still need to observe more stars and build up this distribution. We're doing that. I'd like to push for observing stars in common between these surveys so we can combine the data and do joint analyses. I think the next frontiers, of course, are driven by Gaia and ground-based spectroscopic surveys, but in the context of everything else that's going on and the other observations in the Milky Way and of other galaxies. And uh, again, there are a lot of talks at this conference that highlight the Milky Way in a cosmological context. And for the discussion, I'd like to hear more about stars in the bulge with low metallicities and looking at how, what we can do when we understand the relationship between stellar age and iron and alpha enhancements as signatures of supernovae, channels of formation across the bulge and disk. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Melissa. Uh -huh. Thank you for this very nice talk. It's very informative. Uh, we already have a hand up from uh, Michael Rich. <laughs> yes. Uh very nice talk. Um, I just wanted to point out that the Blanco DCAM bulge survey has 3 million red clump abundances to a precision of 0.2 dex calibrated against uh, U minus I calibrated against high resolution spectra. Oh, and we see a dramatic change at about 500 parsecs where the abundance distribution flips from metal rich to becoming more metal poor. And uh, I, I think our abundances are quite um, uh, robust. We've really mm -hmm. been very careful to calibrate them. And we've also matched a large portion of our sample uh, to Gaia. So I think it, it should be cited and play a role in uh, this uh, understanding. Absolutely, that's fantastic. Uh, would you send me an email, there Mike? Is a talk. There is a talk actually in this meeting. Okay. Uh, so I recommend that, you, that people watch that. They're interested in in learning about this and also see Christian Johnson's paper. But the other thing too, I uh, mentioned is that uh, we are recalibrating the ages um, with missed isochrones. This is led by Meredith Joyce. These are the Benz B ages. And we generally find that the more metal rich stars do seem to be younger, but in the range of eight to 10 giga years with no stars and see the talk by Marchetti younger than two giga years. So, Anyway, that's that's all. Thank you for bringing my attention to that, Mike. I'll definitely cite that work in future. Okay. Um, in the meanwhile, I have a question. That's something that's new for me that I, I didn't know. So you you said that, and I saw from other talks too, that stars that are more metal poor, they don't exactly have the X shape from the... I, I don't understand why, like these stars are older, so they form before, um, could you? Yeah, it's not clear where they, we see different lines of, they've had a, basically a different formation channel. They haven't been redistributed into the boxy morphology via uh, instabilities from the bar. So it looks like there may be some, the, the really interesting signature is that these are still rotating even down to metallicities of minus two. So whether that's been, whether they are, a discrete bulge population formed at very early times or halo stars in the inner region. 
uh, whether they're being spun up uh, by the bulges, I think are really interesting um, uh, set of questions to be looking at. Okay, yep. thank you. Uh, do we have more questions? I think we can uh, follow to the next talk. Thank you again, Melissa. Uh, our next talk is from Jairo Mendez Abreu. Uh, Jairo, can you try to share your screen, please? Okay, can you hear me now, right? Yes, yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Okay, perfect. So <laughs> when it's close to the end, I'll let you know. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today about boxy peanuts in these galaxies. So I guess that at this point of the conference, you are already familiar with the concept of a boxy peanut. But I will try to give you some further insights from an extragalactic point of view on this particular kind of structures. So let me start from uh, a historical perspective on, on the topic. So the first mention of a boxy peanut structure in a galaxy is this one by Barbage and Barbage already in 1959. So they observed this galaxy and you see one to age, and at the center of this galaxy, they describe the, the structure that they see as at the widest part of the nuclear region, there are four bodies of about equal size coming out of the nucleus itself like a cross. So this seems to me like a pretty nice definition of a boxy peanut, uh, taking into account that at, the, at that time, uh, they didn't know what, the, what was the nature of these uh, central structures. It was not until the 80s uh, where uh, the, the interest on the central part of the galaxies on the bulges uh, race again. And I show you here a picture from a paper by Combs and Sander in 1981, in which this is probably one of the first uh, papers in which they try to understand what uh, were these boxy peanut structures and related them to the properties of stellar bars. Of course, nowadays we have telescopes in space, we have better images, we have better techniques to uh, identify boxy peanuts. And with the recent discovery or relatively recent discovery of the presence of a boxy peanuts in our Milky Way, so much more attention is now also again in, into these uh, boxy peanuts. So what are these boxy peanut structures? Again, at this point of the conference, I'm not going to spoil you. I put here I have a nice picture of a, of a bar galaxy. If I tell you that the culprit for this boxy peanut structure are bars. Here, I show you a simulation by Frank Woody and the Auriga collaboration, where you can see how this thick part of the bar uh, seen in projections uh, onto the plane of the sky can give you this particular X-shape uh, characteristic that we call the boxy peanut in uh, external galaxies and also in the Milky Way. And another simulation, this time by Martinez Alpuesta, in which uh, it's clearly shown how uh, we can form a bar in a self-consistent way in a, in a numerical simulation. And if you look at the evolution, at the secular evolution of this bar, you can see how the peanut is formed first uh, in an asymmetric way, only in a part of the, of, uh, of the disk, and then get the symmetric uh, nice feature that we are used to see in edge and galaxies. So, Boxy peanuts are part of the bar and they are created by the secular evolution of the bar. So let me now give you some hints about how we uh, have identified boxy peanuts during the time. Of course, the first uh, type of galaxies that uh, were studied were edge on galaxies where the presence of the peanuts is more easy to, to understand. Several, lot of uh, methods has been developed. Uh, I can tell you here, for instance, on char masking, where the smooth part uh, of the, the, the smooth light of the of the galaxy is removed to see to highlight the X shape of the of the peanut. 
We have also isofold fitting where we look for deviation on the deviation from elliptic from the perfect ellipse uh, in the isofolds of the galaxy, or looking at the stellar kinematics and comparing observation with the expectation for numerical simulations, for instance, using the velocity position diagram and looking for this characteristic A shape in, in this diagram that was uh, nicely demonstrated here in this paper by Bureau and Freeman in 1991. However, edge on galaxies have projection effects. We all know that it's difficult to compute properties of the galaxy when they are seen edge on. So other techniques have been developed during the years uh, for, more, uh, for less inclined galaxies. Uh, in particular, for phase on galaxies, uh, in 2005, the Batistan collaborators um, find a kinematic signature for the presence of a boxy pinut in a galaxy. And this was looking at the four order moment of the line of sight velocity distribution. This is what we usually call the H4. And if you look at this um, parameter along the bar, you will see a characteristic double minima that represents the position of the boxy pinot in your galaxy. This was uh, detected only when your simulation has a, a, a boxy pinot, but when the bar doesn't grow a pinot, then what you get is a kind of flat distribution for the H4. And we demonstrated uh, this uh, signature observationally in 2008 for this galaxy for NGC 98, in which uh, we measure the stellar kinematic along the major axis of the bar. Here, the standard parameters. And if you look at the H4, you will see this characteristic double minima also in observation. So this was the first galaxy, the first Aeson galaxy to uh, where a boxy pinot was detected. Still, uh, this kind of method is very expensive from the observational point of view. You need a very good quality spectra to measure the H4. So other techniques, most based mostly on uh, photometry, have also been developed during the years. And I would like to highlight this one by uh, Erwin and De Batista in 2013, where they focus on the isophotes at the central region of, uh, of bar galaxies and comparing with simulation, they were able to find that if the galaxy has this boxy uh, isophote at the center, followed by some sparse uh, going out of this boxy, you can relate this characteristic shape of the isophote to the presence of a boxy pin. This is, of course, very helpful because we can move from a few galaxies uh, with high uh, signal to noise spectroscopy to imaging where we can uh, study larger samples. But what do we know now then about the statistic, about the fraction of boxy pinots in galaxies? Again, starting from the edge of sample, when it's more easy to detect the, the pinots, here I show you three different articles from Lutike 2000, Yoshino Yamauchi, and 2014, and a recent paper by Marchuk, in which they use larger samples of thousands of galaxies and visually classify uh, the presence of a, of a pinot looking at the isophotes, looking at the residuals after photometric decomposition, or doing a mix between a visual classification and a machine learning approach. And you can see how there is a kind of time evolution on the bar fraction, on the boxy pinot fraction in these galaxies. Of course, some of this difference can be attributed to the visual classification, so this is highly subjective. But I think that also there is a, a physical uh, reason underlying this, uh, and this was uh, nicely shown by Irwin and De Batista in 2017, because the boxy pinot uh, frequency in bar galaxies is a strong function of the stellar mass. Here you can see how massive galaxies, so for instance, if we take galaxies with masses larger than 10 to the 10.4, we get a fraction of boxy pinot of 79%, 79% sorry, but for the lower mass uh, galaxies, this uh, fraction can be just as low as 12%. So this can be one another reason that might make this um, difference in the previous classifications. Another interesting point with relate, related to this is that if we look at the bar fraction instead, not the boxy pinot fraction, but the bar fraction in galaxies, this is also a strong function of the stellar mass. Here I show you a paper uh, that we did in 2012 and also by Erwin in 2018, in which you can see how the bar fraction is a strong uh, function 
of the stellar mass. But the peak, the maximum efficiency in which uh, uh, bar, uh, bars are formed, is at a different mass. This is for in our work, it was about 10 to the 9.4, and for Erwin, it's about 10 to the 9.8. So it seems that bars uh, are formed preferentially in galaxies uh, at a different mass that where then these uh, bars form the boxy peanut. I don't know, maybe someone here in the audience can tell me better if uh, this has been already explained uh, by uh, simulations, but uh, I don't know what is the reason either for this uh, mass evolution of the boxy peanut or for the difference in mass with the peak of the bar fraction. And moving to a bit of more theoretical part on the formation of, of these structures of boxy peanut, the most common mechanism that has been claimed to form boxy peanuts is the bar vacuum. Here I show you a simulation in which uh, a bar is formed, and then you will see again how the peanut is uh, developed uh, first in an asymmetric way, so only in one part of the uh, one side of the disk, and then with the time it gets symmetric and it gets uh, the, the characteristic peanut shape that we are used to, to see in HOT galaxies. Uh, this backlink can be recurrent, can happen more than once in the lifetime of the bar. Uh, the first backlink form the boxy peanut in a relatively quickly way, in one or two giga years, but the second backlink lasts longer and occur mostly on the other parts of the bar. Uh, but bar backlink is not the only way of forming boxy peanuts. And here I show you uh, three different simulations from a recent paper by uh, Selwood and Gerhardt in which they show uh, three different ways of forming a boxy peanut. In the left is the one that I showed you before, is the bar backlink. In this particular simulation, the bar form 0.7 giga years after the initial, the, the beginning of the simulation and the boxy peanut form 1.5 giga year after. So here you have this uh, a bit less than a giga year for the formation of the boxy peanut. And then, they uh, here in the center, in the central panel, this is a simulation in which uh, they include a central mass concentration to avoid the bar from, back, from backlink. And what they get is that uh, the boxy peanut is a still form, mainly by uh, orbits of a star that are trapped by, into vertical resonances. And in this case, the bar formation gets delayed a bit, formed after two giga years from the beginning of the simulation, and the boxy peanut grow at the same time as the bar grow. In the right, there is a third simulation that they claim is a new way of forming uh, this kind of uh, boxy peanut structures in which they force the simulation to not back it, and they force it by symmetrized particles above and below the disk plane. In this case, the bar formation is also delayed, also about two giga years, and also the boxy peanut form at the same time as the bar. But in this time, the boxy peanut covered the whole extension of the bar. We are used to an scenario in which the boxy peanut is the central, thick, vertically thick part of the bar, but then you have still a long, thin bar coming out of this. But in this case, the boxy peanut will cover most of, uh, of the bar. Uh, observationally, we have little evidence for uh, what is the main mechanism uh, forming this kind of boxy peanut structures. Probably uh, this one is one of the, of the few examples uh, in which uh, uh, for two galaxies, a bar has been detected in the backlink phase. So maybe bar backlink is uh, still the main uh, dominant mechanism for the formation of this system. This is in a paper by Erwin and the Batista in 2016, but we still need more observational evidence to know which one is the main mechanism for the formation of these boxy peanuts. And now let's move into uh, why do we care? What, why do we think these uh, boxy peanuts are, are, are important for understanding better galaxy evolution? And I will give you only uh, a few example, examples that in my, from my point of view are, are interesting. So the first one is that uh, we can use boxy peanuts to time the epoch of bar formation, or at least to put a lower limit on the bar uh, on the bar formation. I took this plot from <clears throat> a paper by Crook and collaborators in 2019, um, 
where they studied the boxy-peanut fraction evolution with redshift, and they claim that uh, boxy peanuts start appearing at about redshift one. This will be about eight giga years ago, more or less. And looking uh, at uh, articles and, and papers about where the bars start appearing in the, in the universe, they seem to be uh, starting to appear at redshift about 1.5 or two. So this will mean something like nine to 10 giga years ago. So the time delay between the formation of bars and the formation of boxy peanuts which will be around one to two giga years, seems to match with what is predicted from simulation from bar backing. Of course, this is still need to be, uh, to be done, uh, to be confirmed, but see the talk by Sander Crook about this. And uh, this will be a, a way of at least saying that if a galaxy uh, has a boxy peanut, the bar should have been there at least from one to two giga years before. Another um, important point is that uh, using the presence of boxy peanut in galaxies, we have been able to demonstrate that inner and outer bars evolve in a similar way. This is from a paper that we published in 2019. Uh, this is part of the, of the timer survey. And we were able to detect for the first time a boxy peanut in the inner bar of NGC 1291. Uh, this galaxy is a double bar galaxy. It has an outer bar and an inner bar. And using the H4 parameter and the double minima, we were able to detect a boxy peanut in the inner bar of this galaxy. So if a boxy peanut is present in this, um, in this galaxy, we can assume that uh, this bar can be, has been formed from a cold disk and it has secondary evolved in the same way about how the bar by backlink or by other methods, but producing a boxy peanut. So this is important because the formation of these inner bars is highly debated in the, in the literature, and this gives us some observational constraint to, to the models. Following up on this work, we perform also an analysis of the star formation histories of the different components in this galaxy. This is a paper by De Lorenzo Cáceres and collaborators. And combining the ages uh, of the different structures and the uh, implications that the presence of a boxy peanut have, we estimate that the inner bar in this galaxy is at least 6.5 giga year old. So this means that the inner bar in this galaxy is a long-lived system. So this somehow again confirmed that inner and outer bars evolve in a similar way. Another point is uh, the presence of the composite bulges. So the fact that bulges uh, or uh, central structures at the center of galaxies can coexist. So boxy peanuts uh, are one of the systems or they coexist uh, with other central structures. In a paper in 2014, we estimate uh, that 70% 70, 70 of our galaxies should host composite bulges. Here I show you, for instance, uh, a galaxy and you see 1640, where we detected the boxy peanut using the H4 parameter, but we also detect a central nuclear disk in the kinematics, and it is also shown here in the Anshar masking of the HSP image, where you can see even the spiral arms. So, of course, this is important because we need to know which structures are present at the center of the galaxy if we want to understand the full evolution of the galaxy. So this will be explained better and, and, and larger tomorrow in the tomorrow on Friday by in the in the, in the talk by Peter Irwin. But just to show that the boxy peanuts coexist and not only with um, disks at the center, but also with other kind of structures. Here is the case of two galaxies that are apparently similar. Both galaxies host a boxy peanut, but in one case at the center we have a dispersion dominated system, and in the other we have a disk. So several structures and different can coexist at the center of, of these galaxies. And last but not least is, of course, the presence of the boxy peanuts in our Milky Way. I'm not going to enter here into details. You have already here a lot of beautiful talks about the Milky Way and the boxy peanut in the Milky Way. Uh, just uh, to remember here this uh, ability of the bars to vertically separate different extra population. This is shown here in, in, in this figure by Frank Goody and collaborators where uh, uh, metal-rich stars are mainly forming the peanut while 
metal poor stars form this kind of thick uh, roundish uh, structure. But what I would like to point out is that this has been also detected not only in the Milky Way, but also is observed in a stagnant galaxy. So this is from a paper by Gonzalez and collaborators in which they use Muse, Muse data for this galaxy, NGC 4710, and they uh, show how the metallicity distribution, the vertical metallicity distribution of, um, of stars in this galaxy is also consistent with the prediction from the kinematic fractionation of a boxy pin. So we can also uh, uh, check that this uh, kind of method works for uh, galaxies uh, external to the Milky Way. So just reaching my conclusions, so boxy pinots are part of the bar and they form an evolve naturally out of the bar. So uh, boxy pinots have the, the, the ability to change the structure, the dynamics, and also the stellar populations of the central region of this galaxy. And therefore, understanding more about this kind of structure is important for uh, understanding galaxy evolution in general. And of course, uh, uh, there are a lot of open questions that I will leave here maybe for, for the discussion. So thank you. Thank you very much, Jairo. That was a great talk. Um, do we have questions already? Well, if not, I, I do have uh, questions about this a lot <laughs> in this sense. Uh, but I'll let Fe uh, Federico go first. Uh, Federico, can you? Uh, yes, you can go. Thank you. Very nice talk. At some point, you mentioned that the peak in the bar fraction occurs at stellar masses around 9.5 in log. Did I understand correctly? 10 to the 9.4, yeah. So I'm very surprised about this because we think that galaxies with these masses are strongly submaximal. So the dynamics down in the inner parts is dominated by the dark matter edo rather than the stellar disk. And this should actually inhibit the formation of bars because the stellar disk is not self-gravitating. So if you check this against the prediction of cosmological simulations or other types of simulations? Uh, this has been shown in, in a few already um, observational studies. Here I show you just these two, but uh, there are more people have uh, already shown that this is the distribution more or less. Uh, I don't know if uh, of any uh, article doing this. Maybe Peter has any, any, any clue on this. But it is clear that the distribution goes like uh, for the, the dwarf galaxies, uh, they don't host uh, bars, mostly because they are puff up and they are not uh, dynamically cool to form a bar. And we think, or at least I think, that in the, in the higher masses is because we are starting to be dominated by big bulges that maybe uh, also inhibit the formation of the, of the bar. Uh, we show in this paper that these uh, stellar masses change from the field, which is uh, this uh, green line, and we move, when we move to the to the cluster, so it's also depend, there is also a secondary dependence with environment. The peak on the maximum uh, efficiency of bar move to higher masses, but I think this doesn't uh, uh, relate to the point that it is being maximal in, in cluster or not. So I don't think this is a, a reason for this. Sorry, I don't have a better answer for you. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. But I, I think this is potentially a big problem because I mean, galaxies of those masses, according to you know our best estimates of the stellar mass and the rotation curves, are dark matter dominated down down to the inner parts. Okay, so we need to look in details on this. Well, uh, Martin added a comment. I think this can help with this discussion in the Slack chat and you guys are, can see. Um, but okay, I can move on for Francesca's uh, question. Yeah, just I wanted to say that this is a, a very good uh, point that Federico brings up. Um, maybe just to add some more complication there is that also, of course, if you have some kind of interaction happening um, with a satellite galaxy, this can also trigger um, bar formation as well. So it would be really interesting. I mean, it's interesting that in the in the spot that you show, Jairo, there is no 
um, in, in, for example, in the Virgo cluster, where you would expect more of these interactions to happen, this, this peak in bar, in bar fraction happens at higher masses. But this also can trigger, um, these interactions can also trigger bar formation, which might be um, more triggering for lower mass galaxies. But it would, it's definitely interesting to try and understand what's happening there. Yeah, our, our suggestion for this shift in the peak uh, at the time, at least, it was that uh, in, in cluster you have uh, more interactions and galaxies at lower masses, the potential is lower, so they naturally will uh, hot somehow, they will puff up more easily than, than massive galaxies. So maybe this is the reason why we don't find so many bars in, uh, in this range of masses in cluster, and they, they are shift to the more massive galaxies that are that have a stronger potential, and they can uh, hold uh, with interactions that they suffer in the, in the cluster. This was our, our suggestion, but uh, uh, at the time. So I don't know if anyone has a, a better explanation for this. Uh, Federico, I don't know if your hand is still up or you have a, an, a comment on this. OK, so uh, Peter, you can uh, ask your question. It's the last uh question. So I, I was just going to add, make a minor comment, which is that um, the the lower plot that shows the plot from my 2018 paper is the, the red points are S4G within 25 megaparsecs. So that includes Virgo and, and, and the Fornax cluster, but it doesn't include Coma or other really massive clusters. So the, if there's a difference that may be suggested by Hyro's plot above in the really massive clusters like Coma, it wouldn't show up. Uh, locally. That, that, that was all I was going to say. Okay, well, thank you uh, very much for your comment too. Uh, thank you, Jairo, for your talk. Uh, we're going to move on to the last talk of the day, and then we'll have the break and we have more discussion on this, so we can add more on this conversation. Our last talk of the day is from Guo Yicheng. Uh, Guo, can you share your screen? Okay, perfect. I'll let you know when it's close to the end. Okay, just give me one minute. Let me close those uh, windows. Okay, um, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. So um, my name is Yi Chang Go, and uh, I'm from the uh, University of uh, Missouri, Columbia. So uh, first, uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk about uh, my work on collapse. So um, here are a figure from my uh, 2012 paper, and uh, those are 10 star-forming galaxies around the redshift 2. Now we are moving back to cosmic time to high redshifts. And you can see uh, clamps are very clearly seen in the rest of frame uh, UV images. Those are HST images. And um, I'm going to talk about the physical properties and evolution of uh, those clamps and also to discuss whether the clamps can be the building blocks of today's uh, galactic bulges. So um, this work has been done together with many um, collaborators. Some of them are here, Dan um, Daniel and Mark, and uh, most of my collaborators are coming from Candles and UV Candles team. So this is a nice image from um, uh, ESO's uh, press release in 2013. Um, the paper was led by Bomi Lee, and uh, in this paper, we find the morphology physical property correlation, which you can call it a Hubble sequence in the local universe, has already been established back to 11 billion years ago around the redshift 2.5. Um, by the way, you may um, have seen a different version of this uh, nice figure but that version is just an illustration. And this version uses real galaxies at the correct redshifts to show you the comparison and the contrast of low redshift and high redshift galaxies. So you can see for early type galaxies, well, overall, all galaxies are small back to high redshifts. Early type galaxies, they are still uh, football shape, basketball shape objects similar to their local uh, counterparts. But if you look at uh, 
star forming galaxies, they are quite different from uh, today's star forming galaxies. And um, here is a zoom in um, view of uh, different star forming galaxies at different uh, cosmic times. So if you compare today's galaxies and uh, those uh, at 7, 11, 12 billion years ago, you can find that high redshift galaxies, they don't have those well-defined structure components that we know today, for example, bulge, spiral arms or bars. And instead, what you can find is those giant clumps, for example, here, here, and here. So what are those clumps and uh, how were they formed? And uh, what are they going to do once they were formed? Okay, to give you a more um, direct comparison of the size and the magnitude of the clumps, uh, I'm using example from our local universe. So this is the NGC uh, 604, which is the largest H2 region in the local group, also the second most massive H2 region. And the, the most massive H2 region in the local group is asserted Rodas in Large Magellanic Cloud. So the size of this H2 region is about 200 parsec, and the mass is 10 to 5. So this is a ground-based image. And if you look at the UV in UV, so this is a galaxy image of M33 and NGC 604. Well, you can still see that, putting it aside. But suppose you redshift M33 and this H2 region back to redshift 1.5. And then you match the observational conditions of a Hubble Space Telescope. And this is what you get. Can you still tell well, uh, where NGC 604 is? Probably you can, it's here. Okay, keep in mind, this is the largest H2 region and the second most massive H2 region in our local universe. And now I'm going to show you a real galaxy, star forming galaxy at redshift 1.5 from candles observed by Hubble Space Telescope. You can see several very obvious clumps. And uh, keep in mind that here, the grayscale is said to be logarithmic. So that means those clumps, they are not just brighter or larger than NGC, 604, they are like 10 times or even 100 times brighter or more massive than NGC 604. And those are, are clumps that I'm going to talk about today. And here is a nice uh, uh, picture from uh, Bruce M. Green's paper back in 2007. At that time, people already find clumps in different types of galaxies. And those clumps, they are mostly seen in very deep rest of frame UV optical images. And um, now we can also find them from emission light, emission light maps, for example, H alpha map or CO maps. And we find them across a wide redshift range from 0.5 more or less to redshift five. And also the mass, we believe clumps have very high stellar mass, 10 to seven, or 10 to nine. Again, as I said, 10 times or 100 times more massive than local H2 regions. And the size is kind of uh, controversial. Uh, some people arguing about a uh, larger size for one KPC, and some people arguing for a smaller size, a few hundred percent. And those clumps, they are very blue in UV optical color, which means they have very high specific star formation rate or star formation rate. So that specific star formation rate is usually a few or several times higher than the overall specific star formation rate of their host galaxies. And together, if you have a clumpy galaxy and you count the star formation contribution from clumps, it's about 15%. And uh, uh, many of those clumps, they are found in disk galaxies. So some of them may be merged or merged uh, remnants, but many of them can be found uh, in disks. That was uh, based on either morphological analysis, such as index or kinematic analysis, for example, H alpha or gas kinematics.
So you may ask, like how many high redshift galaxies are clumpy? So here is a statistics from my 2015 paper. And uh, this plot shows you the clumpy fraction as a function of redshift. And the clumpy fraction means you have a sample of a star forming galaxies. How many star forming galaxies contain at least one UV bright off center clumps? So we emphasize the off center because we don't, we don't want to include the uh, bulge progenitors in this statistics. So you can see back to redshift 2.5 or 3, about 60% of uh, star forming galaxies are clumpy, regardless of uh, stellar mass. But when you go to lower and the lower redshifts, clumpy fraction of uh, massive galaxies drops quickly down to just 10% around the 0.5. And the clumpy fraction of low mass galaxies keeps a constant down to um, redshift 0.5, it's still 60%. And uh, we know that for massive galaxies, clumps are very likely to form slow violent disk instability. And the prediction of violent disk instability can explain this uh, decrease of clumpy fraction because massive disks, they become gas, um, gas pool and they become stable and stable when we move to lower and lower redshifts. But the formation mechanisms of clumps in low mass galaxies, um, I don't think we have a clear answer about that. Violent disk instability may play a role, but we may need minor mergers or accretions. So uh, I think low mass galaxies is important. I will come back to this point later. So uh, also, this is just the clumpy fraction. We need more studies on the demographics of clumps and the non clumpy galaxies. Uh, clumpy and the non clumpy galaxies. Like why some galaxies are clumpy, why some galaxies are not clumpy. So uh, I'm not going to detail, but um, those uh, studies are currently uh, very insufficient in the, uh, this field. Next, I'm going to connect clumps to the topic of this conference, bulge formation. And uh, people may ask, okay, clumps, they have very high stellar mass. And so can they be the progenitors of today's bulges or can they contribute to the bulge formation? So um, many people argued that, yes, they can do that. And this is the figure showing by uh, M. Green in 2008. So this is uh, from simulation, you have uh, large disk galaxies and you have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six clumps. And as time goes by, those clumps will gradually migrate into the center and merge to each other. And then they will form a bulge or a progenitor of today's bulge. So the time scale, this is very important, is about several hundred million years. If you want to see more simulations or more, um, more latest results, you can check out uh, Daniel Severino's paper, uh, Frederico Bernardo's paper, and also uh, a recent paper from uh, Bernardo's group. Okay, the picture is good, but then you have to uh, solve the issue. That is, can clumps survive such a long time? Because there is something to prevent that. So that's a feedback. Uh, feedback is one of the core problems in galaxy formation. So what does feedback mean? Feedback means any format, any types of energy or momentum that uh, a galaxy deposit into its interstellar medium or even in um, circular galactic medium to regulate the star formation. So those energy or momentum is used to slow down or stop star formation by heating up the gas or by blowing away the gas. And the sources of feedback can be AGM, supernova feedback, galactic wind, or photoionization, et cetera, et cetera. And unfortunately, clump themselves are the very strong source of feedback because as I said, their specific star formation rate is very high. Um, so what would the feedback do? So if a feedback is too strong, it will just uh, destroy the clump 
in 10 or 20 million years. Okay, now you have a challenge. If we want clumps to contribute to body formation, clumps have to survive long enough. And whether they can survive long enough depends on how strong the feedback is. And here is a nice uh, comparison showing by the new at all 2012. Same simulation, same initial condition, same recipes. The only difference is one has feedback, very strong wind, one has no feedback. And you can see, so this is the time. The one with strong feedback in about 30 million years, this clump is just disappeared, destroyed by the feedback. But if you don't have feedback, and this clump can survive up to about 150 gig years, and at that time, it already sink to the center of galaxy, uh, galaxy and merge to other clumps or merge to the bulge. Okay, now the question is, what is the age of clumps? And uh, uh, the age of clumps are, is a very sensitive to feedback. So here you have, uh, we have two simulations. One is art run by Daniel Savonero and the other one is fire. They have a comparable uh, resolution, but they have different recipes of uh, feedback. Just by looking at the morphology, they look quite similar. But if you measure the age of clumps, find in art and in fire, they show an order of magnitude difference. So fire's clump has a lifetime around 10 and at most 20 million years. But the art clumps, they have a lifetime about 100 million years or even a few hundred million years. Okay, so this is from the perspective of uh, theorists. As an observer, what can I do to tell the difference um, between different uh, recipes and uh, simulations? So we can measure, we can first identify clumps and then use broadband SCT fitting to measure physical properties of the clumps, cell mass, star formation rate, age. So here is an example uh, in my um, first paper about the clumps in 2012. So we can see a clear age gradient of clumps. So that means clumps close to the center of the host of galaxies, they are redder, they have less star formation, and they are older, they are more dense, uh, denser, and they have more dust. But the important thing is they are older. So clumps in the outer skirts, oppositely, they are bluer, they have uh, more star formation, they are younger, they have less dust, they are less dense. And uh, the result shows a clear age gradient. Center clumps older, outskirts clumps are younger. So back to 2012, we have only 10 galaxies, the 10s that I showed on my first slide. And uh, in 2018, now we have uh, thousands of uh, galaxies from the candle survey and we repeat the analysis this time we break the galaxies into groups at different ratios and the stellar mass. Okay, we confirmed our result in 2012. We still see very steep slope of age gradient. Center clumps are older, outskirts clumps are younger, and that's age gradient um, is there for low mass galaxies, intermediate mass galaxies, and high mass galaxies. And we can see this uh, age gradient up to redshift two. And beyond redshift two, again, our um, clump sample is kind of small and we didn't see very clear age gradient. Okay, now we have an age gradient and we know simulations, they also produce an age gradient. Can we compare our observation to simulations? So here is a result. So here, Mandelker et al. compared my results from 2012 with the result from their simulation, the art simulation. So this is a Mandelker 2014 and 2017, uh, similar result. So you can see the observed age gradient match the simulated age gradient very well. Okay, then, 
we can come back, uh, we can go back to the simulation to trace each clamp to see what happened. Here is a, a screenshot from uh, Severino et al. 2009. It's an early paper. Um, if you want to see more latest uh, results, uh, please check out uh, Daniel Severino's talk for uh, latest simulation and also for the discussion of the uh, different uh, components, uh, stars, old stars, gas, and even dark matters. So here, the, the number is the, the, um, the time. In about 250 million years, migration time scale, clumps sink to the center to form the bulge or the progenitors of uh, today's bulge. And uh, during the migration, clumps become redder, older, denser, and a little bit less um, um, star forming. A little bit, I would say, less star forming. Recently, uh, Avisha Daiko has a bus top model, try to model the gas accretion rate and the feedback uh, um, outflow loading factor of gas and the uh, loading factor of a star and uh, also the um, gas fraction. So his model also match uh, my observations very well. So this is the mass of clumps as a function of age, and also this is the mass of clumps now normalized by the total mass of the galaxies as a function of distance to the center of uh, galaxies. So this model predicts that uh, star formation rate and the gas mass are more or less uh, constant or maybe decrease a little bit with time. But because you are uh, continuing forming new stars, the stellar mass of clumps increase linearly with time. And how long does that take a clump to go from outskirts to the center? It takes about uh, 10 times of the disk dynamic time and the uh, disk dynamic time at redshift two is about uh, 20 million years. So again, it takes about uh, 200 million years for clumps to go into the center. Well, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, two minutes, please. Oh, sure. Um, okay, so I'm uh, coming to my conclusion. Um, we try to set up a connection between clumps and the bulge formation. So some good news, they are clumps, they are, um, first, they are a very prominent feature of uh, high redshift galaxies, and they can be used to, to test many uh, of our understanding of uh, high redshift galaxies. Good news is some clumps, they are long-lived. Long-lived means they have an uh, age or lifetime about 100 million years. And feedback, it does not, it does not or it cannot destroy all clumps. So those survive the clumps, they can migrate into the center of uh, the galaxies to form a bulge. This is a uh, uh, inward migration. And uh, we have uh, some observational evidence, the negative age gradient of clumps to support the inward migration. Okay, then let's come to challenges and uh, open questions. The first one, I think it's not about just about clumps, it's about to find the progenitors of uh, today's Milky Way galaxies. So, the progenitors of today's Milky Way galaxies cannot be a 10 to 11 solar mass galaxy at redshift two. It got to be a low mass galaxy. But right now, most of our studies on clumpy galaxies focus on massive galaxies. So that's why I mentioned for low mass, low mass galaxies, we're not sure about the formation mechanism of clumps. And we are not sure about what is the fate of those clumps in low mass galaxies. Low mass means 10 to nine or 10 to 10 at most. The second is, uh, do we have enough uh, resolution and the sensitivity to resolve clumps to detect fainter clumps? So we have uh, several um, solutions and it's good to see many of uh, the uh, participants in this conference, they are working in different uh, directions to solve this uh, problem. And uh, here I show you, um, I'd like to uh, show you some um, um, 
participants work, uh, work and encourage you, you to look into their talks. For example, we can use local analogs. We can find some local clumpy galaxies, although they are rare, but they, there are some. And uh, we got a high resolution, high sensitivity, and you can check out uh, uh, Fisher's talk. Also, we can use the cosmic magnification. So that's lens the galaxies. They can really resolve into small scale and can tell us where the clumps are one kpc large or 100 parsec large. And you can check out the, the Sarkis uh, Zawadis piece talk on Friday. And also we are waiting for JWST. Um, I don't have to emphasize more about that. So if we have resolution and sensitivity, how can we identify clumps? Uh, I don't think we want to use the video inspection on a large sample. Can we still use the traditional source detection algorithms like what I use in my paper? Or can we use some very new and more efficient algorithms like machine learning and deep learning? And uh, I think uh, Marco Akrotas company is going to talk about that on Friday. Check out his talk too. And then we are going to measure clump properties. Age is the key. Uh, right now, just based on uh, rest of frame, rest optical broadband uh, information, we are not able to break the age dust the metallicity degeneracy. We need uh, multi wavelength observation. We also need to know gas and the dust. And also mass of clumps, 10 to 6, 10 to 7, 10 to 8, or 10 to 9. We want to know not just the stellar mass, but also gas mass. And uh, I think uh, um, you can check out uh, Zanilo's talk about the mass and the contribution to bulge formation. And uh, again, we need the star formation rate. Uh, we need uh, not just broadband uh, observation, we need the emission line maps, for example, H alpha maps. Uh, Stan White has a, has a very nice work about using uh, HST's Prisma to study H alpha emission line from Clumpy galaxies. You can also check out his uh, review talks. And the question also mentioned in Stan's uh, review talk is about uh, the clumpy appearance of young stars in high redshift galaxies and also the smooth gas distribution in those galaxies. How can we uh, make those two observations consistent with each other? And again, I have to emphasize uh, in a few months, we will see the first set of data of JWST and uh, we hope we can get some new clues about clumps and their contribution to biology formation. And um, that's all, thank you. Thank you both for the talk. Um, we are a little bit behind schedule, so we'll have time for uh, just not a lot of questions. There is, uh, there is a question on the chat from Iris that I will change it to Slack so this conversation can go on on Slack. Oh, someone had the hands up. Yeah, Polychronis, yes, you can, you can go on. Uh, you are muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Ah, thanks. Again, uh, many thanks for this uh, very interesting talk. Uh, a quick question regarding the age determination of uh, inwardly uh, migrating star forming clumps. Um, are these ages based uh, in um, on age alpha or whatever equivalent widths or uh, stellar SED fitting? So it's based on um, stellar SED fitting. Thank you. So we have uh, um, about the seven bands, seven filters uh, observed by uh, Hubble Space Telescope. So uh, we run SED fitting. And uh, um, I have um, to emphasize that uh, the age determination from SED fitting, people think it's not uh, um, that accurate, but uh, here our task is to just uh, separate the age of uh, say 10 million years and uh, 100 million years. So um, SED fitting, I would say is doing a, a, a okay job. For that. Thanks a lot. Thank you. We don't have time for questions now. We're going to have the break and we'll be back in 15 minutes for the discussion. So we'll have a lot of time 
to discuss more about these topics. So we'll be back in 15 minutes, 8.35. Okay. See you soon. Thank you. The chairs will be, sorry, yes, recording in progress. <laughs> uh, the chairs will be Lodovico and Martin, so you guys can go on with the discussion. Okay, so uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, um, so I'm Martin Bureau, and with Lodovico, we'll be chairing this discussion session. Hi there. Um, so uh, the idea was that um, I think we would like to make sure that the contributed speakers have the chance to speak. So we'll start by asking uh, a few questions that were raised uh, in, in the Slack. In fact, asking the people who type those questions to ask uh, the questions themselves. Uh, and then following on from that, uh, we'll go into more open-ended discussions where we've thought of a few questions that could provide uh, you know, uh, an input and a start for that. So um, the first question uh, from Slack, uh, Ludovico, you can uh, take over. Yeah, the first question we, we brought up is a question from Andrea Kunder to, for um, Madeleine Lucy. So if Andrea is here, uh, can uh, uh, ask the question or maybe if preferred i can uh, read it oh i can ask it thank you okay yeah so i thought that was a really nice talk um by by madeline thank you for that and my, my question was more um we've heard a lot in this conference about what we expect to see from um from a disc if you have a disc you know, buckling and forming uh, whatever a, a pseudo bulge and a, a rounder bulge. We haven't seen as much what we expect from a classical, like what we would expect to see um, from a classical bulge. And one of the of the points that um, that Madeline made is that um, her observations will rule out a classical bulge. And I was just kind of confused, of or just kind of wanted to have more um, more insight on what exactly in the observations ruled out a classical bulge, because from my reading of the literature, there can be a wide variety of classical bulges that can form depending on you know, how massive the merger is and what kind of initial conditions that were. Yeah, so I am happy to respond. Um, I, I would first say that I don't mean to completely rule out the possibility of a classical bulge. I just argue that um, there's no need to invoke one given our data. Um, and so, and I say that because um, I think a classical bulge, kind of the signature in the line of, sight, line of sight velocity dispersions would be that they are not a function of the galactic latitude or galactic longitude because it would be a pressure supported system which would have the same um, velocity dispersion. Um, but versus a boxy peanut spectra, we do see that kind of peaked signature at L of zero. And so I would say that we see that, and also that it's also a function of galactic latitude, that at higher latitudes, you have higher, um, at lower latitudes, closer to the plane, you have higher velocity dispersion. Um, so yeah, I would say that's what we see in our data and we, in our, we don't have our velocity dispersions match kind of what we predict for uh, the boxy peanut bulge of the Milky Way. And so we don't need to invoke a classical bulge to raise the velocity dispersions to match the data. Yeah, and then I guess my follow-up comment, I don't know if you saw that because I just posted it, yeah. was that um, when you have larger sample of, samples of stars, I think it's, I, I, and, and even with the, with, the, with the error bars in your analysis, I'm not sure we can, um, for sure come to that conclusion that there is, a, it, that we see this kind of peaky velocity dispersion. Like if you looked at if Anka's talk from session three, she, um, her middle poor stars really show a velocity dispersion that looks more flat. And the Aurelari stars also seem to look more flat. So I wonder, you know, we still have a, a kind of small samples of middle poor stars. I wonder if we begin to build up those samples and are able to, you know, beat down the error, the, the error bars from having, you know, more number of stars in the bin, if, if that will, if, if that will change. But um, yeah, I hadn't thought about looking at the, um, 
the if, if there's a trend in velocity dispersion. So I appreciate that comment. Yeah, and I, I, I've responded to your um, comment in the Slack. And I, I, I do see both in Anka's data, especially when she confines to the 3.5 kiloparsecs, that in general, you do see that the velocity dispersion in the center is higher than at the edges. Um, but whether it's, um, you know, and especially in your data, when you confine to the most inner stars, that's going to be lower because you put a strict constraint on the velocities of those stars by saying they have to be so confined to the center. So that's going to overall lower your velocity dispersion, but you do still see a, um, a peak in the middle. Does anyone else have thoughts on this? Is Anka here perhaps? Anke, you're muted. One second. Claudio Manuela has. Yeah, I, I wanted to comment, but if Anke is here and wants to answer more directly. Yeah, you I, I am now allowed to speak. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say that. I can I can make the the plots that I have shown in my talk also separating again by latitude and seeing if there's a difference. Um, uh, but I, I, the the pig's coverage is not very homogeneous. So at, at some point I start losing the the full rotation curve. But I can I can do that. Yeah. Yeah, same with the Arulari star sample. It's still small in numbers and not as extensive as the as like looking at red clump stars or, or giants in the bulge. Manuela? Can I now? Yeah. Um, on this point, I think um, personally, I am fully convinced now that um, uh, we don't need to invoke a classical bulge, as you worded it. We could make something that resembles the observations that we have so far, even from the disk. Uh, my doubt is that is this the only channel that we can form that? Mm, that component, that more spheroidal component, can we exclude that there was a classical badge? Because not, so far, I think we just demonstrated that we can do it from the disk, but perhaps we would do it also uh, with a classical, uh, a classical badge. Uh, this is one comment that maybe some of the theoreticians could answer to. And, and another related is the fact that in the near future, we would be able to have many more uh, data, especially on kinematics, in the inner part. So far, I have seen models reproducing the observation as close to the plane as we have them. But could they help us uh, maybe fine tuning the observations closer to the plane uh, by pointing us to some kind of observable that would be like this for a classical bulge and like this other for a for a um, disk um, with a bulge for a disk origin. Uh, I would like to see if there is some discriminating observations, especially in the innermost region where more data will be coming in, in two years or so. Melissa had uh, her hand raised. Oh, sure, if there's no uh, further answers uh, on that point. I, may, I have a um, question about, the nomenclature, which is related to the discussion that Andrea and Maddie were having, in that, in Maddie, in your um, Combs 3 survey paper, where you look at the chemodynamical origins of the metal pore bulge stars, you divided the metal pore population up based on their spatial and kinematic properties into halo, bulge, and disc. And you found that the bulge and the halo populations classified kinematically had these different uh, chemical signatures. So, would you? rule out for that bulge population that it what do you think that can you say anything about the formation mechanism of that bulge population based on your data and the chemistry yeah um well so they were they were actually the halo and the bulge were actually pretty similar just very slight differences and the halo had slightly kind of lower alpha values which is a bit more signature of like a slower star formation time scale. So uh, a less slower star formation rate early on. 
um, and the bulge population had really high um, alpha values, even higher than we see in the disc. And so that kind of really kind of points to a population that uh, had a very high star formation. We see so unlikely to be kind of an accreted dwarf system is kind of what it's pointing at. So I think it kind of points more towards an in situ origin for those metal core stars. Okay, so I think, yeah, for the week, ago, I think that's a good place to stop perhaps for, for that question. So the next question that was on Slack for one of the contributed speakers was from uh, Hua Gao to uh, Sandor Crook. So um, while you're there, would you like to ask your question yourself or would you like me to, to read it? Yeah, I think uh, Sandor has answered my questions, but I do have a follow up on, on the Boxyfina bulge. Uh, Maybe this question should be directed to Cairo as well. My question is, uh, is the boxy peanut bulge a transitional feature a, or a long-lived structure? Uh, in simulations, I think it's a long-lived structure. I think uh, even the backlink is recurrent, so it happened more than once during the lifetime of the bar. So once it starts, it will, it will stay there, yes. I agree with Jairo. So this is what simulations say. Um, observation, of course, I think is difficult to, to test. Um, also recurrent buckling. I don't know if we, we observed recurrent buckling yet, but um, yeah, it's, it seems to be a long lived feature. And I see Victor with his hand raised. Yeah, Victor, please go ahead. Yeah, we've looked at this in a number of simulations and isolated and cosmological now. Uh, generally, we find them to be long lived. We have seen the odd one here and there that have been destroyed, uh, usually because the bar itself is destroyed, though. So I don't think we've ever seen one um, destroyed on its own. Okay, I think that's a question. Oh, Peter Irwin, uh, go ahead. Okay, I think you can hear me now. Um, just as a sort of uh, extra comment on that, um, we found about three galaxies in our, our local survey um, out of about 50, where, which are officially unbarred, but on closer inspection seem to have a rather large um, boxy bulges with possibly traces of a thin bar outside. Um, and, and I'm speculating that these might be cases where the main bar, these actually have nuclear bars as well, but we're talking about a larger structure, um, is mostly dissolved, but somehow some, some aspects of the box peanut have still survived. So that's maybe another bit of evidence for their long lived. Okay, very good. I think it's a pretty clear answer that bars tend and box will tend to be long lived except under exceptional circumstances, right? We know they can be destroyed, but it needs very violent uh, process. So Lodovico will go with, with the next question. Uh, yes, uh, que the last question uh, we, we picked up is a question from Luca Constantin to Kirthana Yegarsen. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. So Luca, are you there? I see him. Luca, you're muted. Okay, I can uh, read the question for you if you. It's, the question is about the mass assembly histories of bulges and disks. Is downsizing valid for your bulges and disks? I'm curious because we recently found that not only do galaxies grow in a downsizing fashion, but also each of their morphological components does. Both older disks and older bulges are more massive than younger stellar structures. Also Adriana De Lorenzo Cesar Rodriguez showed in her talk the same trend. And the question was for Kitrana. Yeah, so I I don't know if uh, anyone's already read through it, but I, but I posted an answer and I can summarize through it now if you'd like. 
So essentially, uh, a quick uh, the quick answer would be yes. We do see a downsizing in the in the body manga sample in in our in our sample of spiral galaxies as well. And uh, I I posted an ex a, a new plot there, which is a bit easier to read, uh, which is a bit more uh, visible in the in the trend of stellar mass in, in the way that the in the way that the question can be answered. So. Uh, I don't know if I can share the screen or you just want to, I don't know how to answer this question without showing the screen without the plot. Or can, or whoever, whoever is the host, if they could uh, show the screen. Let me try. Apologies, I'm not sure I have this power. You, you can share the screen now, Peter. Okay, so this, uh, can you see? Yes. Okay, so this is a plot where I show the, uh, the mass weighted uh, stellar populations, especially for the age here, where you have bulged age on the y axis uh, compared to the corresponding disk ages on the x axis. And these are color coded in terms of the stellar mass of the disk on the upper plot and the stellar mass of the bulge on the lower plot. And you can see this is what I, uh, I, I was trying to explain is that. Uh, Higher mass bulges of pure uh, have uh, th 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 there's this uh, pretty much this gradient in stellar mass that you can, that you can see with the uh, uh, higher mass bulges and higher mass disks having older ages and lower mass disks and lower mass bulges having uh, lower ages. So that's essentially my answer to that. So if anyone wants to follow up. Going once, going twice, going thrice. Okay, so um, the next question we have is for a speaker who isn't here. So I think we'll just skip that and, and move on to more general question that can lead to open discussion from everybody, uh, really. Um, so I'll start, I'll take the prerogative. And the, the question or, or the point is really that I think when it comes to differentiating between classical bulges, so and boxy bulges. I think the predictions from simulations for the structure and dynamics are pretty clear, and they have been seen convincingly in observations. However, when it comes to predictions for stellar populations, uh, at least my impression is that the predictions of how to tell the difference are, are, are much less clear and robust. And uh, there could be you know, many reasons for this. Uh, one is, of course, is uh, perhaps we don't understand star formation very well, you know, with star formation with species and simulations. It could be that the spatial resolution of cosmological simulations is not good enough to really resolve the vertical structure of this appropriately. Or in fact, that the high resolution simulation of isolated galaxies just don't know which initial conditions to use when it comes to stellar populations. But in any case, I think it's clear that the predictions are less robust and observationally people are not quite sure what to look for. So I'm just going to leave it at that and ask the people who are uh, involved in this from either an observational point of view or uh, a simulation point of view to pitch in which, uh, well, whether they agree with my statement or how it could be improved. So please raise your hand and, and we'll pass on to you. Aftan, could, could you repeat the question one more time? Yeah, so in short, you know, I think the diagnostic to separate classical bulges from boxy bulges, when it comes to stellar populations, these diagnostics are not really clear which differences should we be looking for. So what is the reason and uh, how can this be improved? So yeah, go on, Francesca. <laughs> so uh, I think um... One thing to say here is that it, it, I think it depends also, again, coming back to this nomenclature issue, what we mean when, when we talk about these structures. So I think, uh, you know, if you look at, for example, um, cosmological simulations, you can see very clearly, you can see what kind of signatures you can expect from mergers or what kind of signatures you can expect, you know, from different pathways of formation. Um, but then, you know, what, then we also often mean different things when, I mean, but then, you know, if you have clump, whether you have 
whether you call a classical bulge something that formed through clumps or whether you call a classical bulge something that formed through mergers, or whether you call a classical bulge anything that has a steep profile, you know, I think that can get a bit confusing. So I think that's, there are clear signatures for what we expect from different formation processes in the stellar populations. Um, but one has to be a bit, I think, careful about the questions that we're asking of the stellar populations as well. Ludovico? Yeah, I think that one of the reasons why we don't have constraints or predictions in stellar population as strong as the kinematic and dynamic is because of the way we started to define a bulge. We started from a photometric point of view and from a morphological point of view. And this means to bring, to move stars from one place to another. So it really involves the um, dynamics. Now about this, the properties of the stars, this depends when this movement started. So you can start this mov movement from um, a young component or an old component. At the end of the same process will end up in more or less the same structure, but with totally different kinematic properties. Sorry, totally different stellar population properties. So one, this is one of the reasons why it is less constrained. So it's kind of boundary condition issues. Sometimes you start the very same process on some conditions, an old population. Some other times you start the very same process with other conditions, uh, another type of stellar population. So I think this is one of the reasons why observables in stellar populations are as not as strong as uh, kinematic or dynamic um, properties. Very good, thank you. Perhaps the Milky Way people could chip in as well because it seems to me we've heard comments from some people that they don't require a classical bulge at all. So was this based purely on the dynamics, on the, on the kinematics, or was this also based on stellar population properties, so ages, metallicities, alpha enhancement, and so on? Yeah, I'd say um, in my work looking at the um, chemistry of metal core stars, um, we didn't find kind of any evidence for kind of a dwarf system that's been accreted or some, some kind of accretion event that would have caused a classical bulge. We saw overall high alpha values, um, so kind of pointing towards in situ origin. Victor, feel free to unmute yourself. If people could just please raise their hands. In the original uh, constraint uh, from Jun Tai Shen, it was basically purely dynamical by looking at the uh, velocity dispersions of the stars uh, from, from their simulations, that if there was a, class, a pressure supported classical bulge any, any more than 10% and you wouldn't be matching any longer to the observed um, velocity dispersion, maybe Mike can say more about that. Uh, we did something similar also looking at the uh, Apogee and Arcos data and we came fairly similar conclusion about 5%. It's coming mostly from the kinematics. And then in terms of the chemistry, we can chemistry we can explain most of what we observed by in situ uh, behaviors. Thank you very much, Kirithana. Um, hi again, but uh, I don't exactly have a comment on this, but more of a question that I'd like to pick uh, the brains of the experts here. But uh, I was wondering, uh, uh, there was a topic that was touched on quite often about composite bulges where you have a uh, boxy peanut uh, a pseudo bulge bar and a classical bulge uh, embedded in each other. So I was wondering what kind of stellar populations would you expect to find in those cases, especially when you uh, when you naively uh, model them as a single component bulge. I think, Wagao, feel free to unmute yourself. Yeah, but uh, I was actually going to ask questions. Uh, I don't have good answers for, yeah. So does anybody have a, an answer or comment on Kirtana's point? before we move on. Uh, Peter, is that, is that 
with respect to that point? Uh, vaguely, I mean, the the timer project um, is look is based on the presumption that if you see, for instance, a nuclear disk, then it should have a different. It, it should have at the the same age or a younger population than the bar. And given that they're looking at massive barred galaxies, their bars will mostly have boxy peanut bulges. And I know that, for instance. Uh, someone showed NGC 4643, it might have been Patricia Sanchez Blasquez, which has a boxy peanut bulge and it has a nuclear disc. And the nuclear disc is maybe slightly younger and definitely a bit more metal rich than the boxy peanut bulge. So from a strictly observational point of view, there, there, there are some hints that you would see, you might see differences. And of course, if there's a nuclear ring going on, and you're seeing younger stars in the nuclear disk than you would have in the boxy peanut bulge. Thank you. Thank you. Kiratana, is that the new hand or is that, is that the old one? Okay. Um, so, so we have a, a few other questions uh, prepared, uh, but uh, Huagao, perhaps you can go. Yeah, I, I just want to share uh, my confusions about uh, classifying bulges according to their uh, formation mechanisms. For example, uh, uh, we call those uh, uh, a box peanut bulge formed by the buckling of bars as pseudo bulges, but their time scale is like uh, one or two gig years. Uh, so I was under the impression that secular processes are, are very slow processes, like uh, they, they could last. Uh, uh, like uh, the order of ten years, so such is is this uh, uh, short time scale still qualify as the uh, one of the secular processes, and also in uh, Bing Hao Guo's uh, talk, the dissolve of the nuclear bars is also uh, uh, has very uh, a very short time scale, and they claim that they form a suitables uh, out of that processes. So uh, I just wanna. Uh, if uh, people can help me clarify, if the time scale is the is the the only uh, key factor of determining if it's a uh, secular processes or a classical bulges, uh, pseudo bulges. Uh, well, certainly my my take would be it's a big part of it. Obviously, for example, the buckling for bulges occurs quite quickly, um, but but it isn't a particularly violent process. But uh, people might might disagree. Um, Peter, you have your hand up. Is that an old hand? Or... Uh. Okay, yeah, I, I, I understand your confusion. The term secular was borrowed, I think, from things like solar system studies, secular resonances, secular chaos, where it does specifically mean long-term and slow processes. And it, it's kind of, the problem is it's kind of mutated to me. So a lot of people mean, use it to mean sort of internal processes, not involving mergers. Although I've even seen papers where people talk about the secular stage of a merger, just to really mess things up. Um, and I remember a paper from Noguchi back in the 90s saying that any, anything having to do with bar formation can't be secular because it happens too rapidly. Um, but I think in practice, there are enough people using secular to mean just sort of internal processes not involving you know, encounters or mergers that you have to be aware that that's what people often, people will mean. And so in that case, sure, bar buckling uh, is secular. And the, 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 the alternative mechanism where it's resonance, where it's sort of resonant heating and trapping of stars is generally supposed to be a slower process. So you know, even that, that, that's also secular. Okay, uh, Ludovico, do you want to take over? I'll remind people to raise your hand uh, if you want to speak. Um, I'm sorry, I, I missed somebody, Enrique, but I, I don't see a raised yeah. hand. Uh, uh, yeah, Enrique wanted to say something, but I'm um, not sure if it's still the case. I have my hand raised. I don't hear anything from Enrique, so... Dimitri, go on. 
Yeah, it's just a comment about the secular. I, again, uh, I, I've, I've been also, I have thought about this also years ago and I was like confused, I mean, because there are some bar related processes that are very fast. So again, just, just complementing what Peter said. And um, so since we've been talking about nomenclature, that's why also I stopped using the secular term and I, I, and I, may, I, I refer to this process as bar driven process, just to avoid the secular term. And one, one other example is the pushing of the gas to the center, which also occurs very fast. When, when the bar forms, the, the, the removal of angular momentum from the gas and the formation of the dust lanes, pushing gas to the center to form the nuclear disk or, or whatever structure in the center, that, that, that happens quite fast. Before we move on, one comment perhaps on this that's really important is that whether it's slow or fast a process, if it merely rearranges things, it won't affect the stellar population. But of course, if we're talking about the star formation it, itself, then the, the speed is crucial to the alpha element uh, abundance, right, increment. So, so we should remember that. Okay, um, before moving on to the next question that we prepared, I was reading before the chat uh, and I found a very interesting argument that Alvio started and I would like uh, to him to give him the opportunity to share with the others is about uh, what's going to happen. I mean, what's the, what are the clamps forming? Alvio, would you like to? Yes, yes, I can. Uh... I can tell you what the answer of uh, John Cormandy was. <laughs> okay, maybe could you repeat the, could you repeat the question? For no, no, no. Okay, yeah, repeat the question. Um, this was, in fact, uh, the IAU in Beijing uh, ten years ago, and uh, John was giving a, a plenary session on the formation of bulges, classical and pseudo, and so on. And so, at the end, uh, I asked the question as to whether as how to call a bulge that would form in a, in a gas-rich galaxy in the early universe uh, by migration of clumps uh, produced by tumor-like instabilities and so on. It took uh, almost a minute uh, of thinking before answering, and eventually he said it would be a classical bulge, which uh, I reconstructed uh, from uh, what he said, that for him was prominent uh, the fact that uh, there was uh, gas dissipation. It was, there was a lot of gas and dissipation, and even if there was no merging, as in a classical, classical bulge, <laughs> uh, for him uh, the, to use the, uh, decided that it was a classical bulge in spite of coming from the disk, and presumably the result would have been uh, um, um, rotating, a cylindrically rotating bulge uh, that may uh, become uh, a bar, that may buckle, and so on and so forth. So uh, I was not convinced, I asked the question ironically, because I never used myself the terms classical and uh, and pseudo bulges because really I never understood the definition uh, of them, and also I didn't like uh, the idea of uh, to a morphological aspect attach automatically a formation process, as it was at least in the original version. So personally, I keep uh, avoiding to use these two concepts, these two words because as concepts, they are loose. Thank you. Any other point of view or comments following what Alvio just said? Um, Victor, please go ahead. Does Martin raise his hands too before me, I think? Okay, go ahead, Victor. Yeah, okay. Um, well, we know of instances where you can merge things at the centers of galaxies and form rapidly rotating things. 
uh, Reed showed this uh, forming the thick disk by having arriving uh, close to the plane of the disk, and he ended up with a thick disk of a galaxy, uh, regardless of the question of whether that's how thick disks form or not. Uh, the final structure was rapidly rotating. And at the other extreme, uh, this is something that Eric uh, referred to yesterday, uh, trying to understand, this is work we did uh, back in 2011, trying to understand how nuclear star clusters form. If you, so if you merge in uh, globular clusters into the center, if those globular clusters come in with the rotation of the disk, so co-rotating with the disk, they will typically settle into something that's extremely rapidly rotating. And then it's uh, difficult to distinguish uh, between that and something that uh, formed out of gas. We had a hard time actually making that, that distinction. So in principle, you can get rapidly rotating bulges in the same sort of way with clumps. And as we heard also from, from talks here, uh, Daniel, et cetera, uh, um, they also bring in gas with them. So they could settle to something that's quite rapidly rotating. Martin? I was just going to remind people of a comment from Chris Brooks from this morning that not only is pseudo bulges ill-defined, but as Alvio you know, said, it's in fact classical bulges also badly defined. And I think I'm convinced by now myself, and I'll probably try to stop using it from today, which is in fact, a classical bulge really should be a mon monolithic collapse, right? That's the oldest idea, which I think none of us take it to mean that. I think most of it would think more of a, a violent, you know, or a merger, a merger. But obviously, as we've just seen, you know, many different processes can lead to essentially fairly spheroidal pressure supported structures. So uh, I think I'm, I'm starting to be convinced by the camp that says even classical bulge is, a, is an ill defined term. Daniel? Yeah, I think what we see in the, in the cosmological simulations is, th is that if the migration is relatively fast compared with the uh, dynamical time scale of the disk, if the process is violent, then we see uh, a barge with a, a high Celsius index. This is what we see in the simulations, mostly because it's a violent process, also dissipative by nature. Also, the time scale is, is important. Okay, thank you. So I'd like to move to, to the next question we, we put in our list. I'm not sure how easy it will be to answer to this question, but let me ask it anyway. And we often ask ourselves, what's the, what was the formation scenario for a bulge, one bulge, however, a bulge can undergo several physical processes associated to different formation scenarios during its lifetime. So there is not only one scenario for a given bulge. Uh, how can we understand uh, if a certain process X had occurred when and what is uh, its contribution to the present day properties of that bulge? Uh, I see Polychronis wants to say something. You're muted. Unmute, yeah. Thanks. Um, actually, I was um, I was about to ask another question, but uh, uh, also your question, Ludovico, is interesting. Uh, what is the our visibility time scale, our look back time? Uh, how long back in time can we trace uh, a uh, dynamically relevant uh, effects uh, in terms of the, for instance, uh, the dispersion uh, of stars. Um, uh, the relaxation time scale is, of course, long, and one can most probably infer for collisionless uh, fluids uh, for a long time certain dynamical effects. Uh, but I do not have any answer. I have uh, one question only uh, related to, to AGM. It's a completely different topic. Uh, forgive me if I'm changing the subject quickly. Uh, can, we learn something, um, can we learn something about uh, bulge formation? Uh, take into account uh, AGN statistics. For example, uh, why does it happen that um, rotationally supported uh, 
high angular momentum, um, probably most gas rich uh, uh, parts happen to be primarily uh, in the um, jet mode, uh, whereas uh, spheroids, uh, so gas poor or gas devoid spheroids, both uh, uh, massive bulges and ellipticals happen to be uh, mostly in the advection dominated um, uh, jet mode. What is the reason for that? Can we learn something about budget formation? Uh, just by the fact that uh, morphology and kinematics tells us something about the ability of a stellar triaxial system to host or not an AGN. What's the connection? I don't have an answer, but Melissa just raised uh, her hand after your question, so I'm hoping she has I, I've been uh, trying to say something for a while, if I might. Okay, um, sorry. Thank you. Yeah, um, in our galactic bulge, the, one of the things that we are uncovering from the Blanco DCAM bulge survey is that there seems to be two broad formation mechanisms going on. The uh, bar, the metal rich bar, of course, is progressively more metal rich toward the plane. This confirms what many people have seen. We have reanalyzed the ages from Bensby using mist isochrones, and we found that the most metal rich stars in Bensby sample have an age range of around eight to 10 billion years, but they're noticeably younger than the most metal poor stars. Now, we also see two different abundance distributions a more simple model, one zone-like abundance distribution within 500 parsecs, and a different abundance distribution with a metal pore peak at minus 0.4 dex in the outer, beyond 500 to say two kiloparsecs, 500 parsecs to two kiloparsecs. Um, and we think that rather than fitting these distributions with Gaussians, they represent two different chemical evolution events, perhaps. Notably, all of these populations are cylindrically rotating. Now, in the K-Rose model, or K-Rose data, we see a low alpha and high alpha, very strong dichotomy um, in the chemical evolution in alpha to Fe versus Fe over H. Yes. In other studies like Johnson 2014 and Rojas Ariagada, you don't see such a strong break. Nonetheless, I kind of am beginning to think that because there are, there are no radial gradients over the inner 10 degrees, that is the inner two kiloparsecs, in the abundances, no significant radial gradients, and yet there are very strong vertical gradients and cylindrical rotation, that we may be seeing two somewhat disk or originated formation events. An early one that is connected to the thick disk and is more metal poor, and a later one that is connected to the bar and is more metal rich. So if I understood correctly, these two different events they are maybe not related to each other. They form what we see the same bulge, more or less, but they give different, they bring different properties to the final product. I don't know, you know, we are looking at the kinematics because mm -hmm. we'll have much of it matched with Gaia, but it seems like the two abundance distributions can be so well disentangled, and this is not yet published, but I do show it in my talk. They can be so well disentangled that you can follow the metal poor peak into the plane for the metal poor population. So it is a distinct population that can be distinguished from the metal rich component. Uh, and interestingly, um, the width of the metal rich distribution increases toward the plane, and there may be some metal poor stars that are associated with the formation event 
that made the metal rich bar, which you expect in a simple model of chemical evolution. But what's noteworthy is that the peak of the metal poor distribution actually uh, rises very slightly to higher metallicity as you move into the plane. But the shape of the distribution really remains very well you know, defined. So uh, the, at that all being said, it, you know, I could almost see an ancient, very ancient early on event that helped that was associated with the thick disk and a later bar formation event that formed the bar. It's very interesting. Now, Melissa wanted to say something. Oh yeah, I don't want to hear from her. Sure, this is just in response to the point you made, Ludovico, and, and Mike, you also just made this point as well, that I think if we ask, if we're asking questions about when, we really need observational ages for stars in the bulge. And I think this will be moving forward, one of the, the biggest factors that we need in order to make that next step in constraining the time scale of these formation, different formation events. And I think that we, it's not, you know, obviously the, the age of the stars is not the same thing as the age of the structure, but I think we can leverage the correlation between the age of the stars, their orbits, which we're getting from Gaia, and their iron and magnesium abundances and their transition out into the disk to place very strong constraints on the way that this is formed in detail. Um, and I know that we're getting spectroscopic ages, but these are imprecise. They're about 30%. So I think uh, the next step will be getting very faint stars in the bulge for large numbers at the turnoff where we can get more precise ages. So that's just the observational perspective. Ages are key. Alvio? Uh, yes, following on what Mike just said, uh, this uh, uh, impressive dichotomy in the magnesium or alpha over iron versus iron over H uh, plot in K. Rose uh, papers, uh, is not uh, limited uh, to the bulge. It extends all the way to very high, large distance uh, from the center to 12 kpc. And, uh, and so uh, it looks as if the Milky Way is not just one galaxy. It is two galaxies on top of each other. I'm not sure, though, that the two discs, actually, there is exists. a thick disc and a thin disc, yeah. certainly. But this dichotomy extends all over the plane of the galaxy and above it. Yeah, I'm not so sure, though, that the alpha to Fe really exists, you know, that that dichotomy that K. Rose reports is confirmed by other surveys, particularly Rojas Ariagata. I, I agree. I, I take it uh, in the at face Just value in the because I have no arguments to invalidate yeah. it. Yeah. So I assume K. Rose is right. If uh, she is right, then, uh, as I said, as a provocation, Milky Way is two galaxies on top of each other with two independent uh, chemical histories. Melissa, well, in you... some sense, the thick disk and thin disk are kind of that way, but in, there may be an older thing in the bulge, which is the bar. So the bar may be a, an old thin disk that evolved. But <laughs> okay, I'll use that an old hand. Anybody else wants to come on this point? Bruce? Uh, yeah, can you hear? Yeah, Alvio, the, this is a good point. We, we looked at this and in the thick disk studies I did with um, Sebastian Comeron, uh, showing nearly equal mass, thick and thin, as we've heard before today. If you just look at the history of star formation in the universe of the Milky Way, you get about half the stars at, at fairly high turbulence, at very high star formation rates, like the first 10% of the universe at 10 times the star formation rate compared to the last 
90% of that one tenth of star formation rate. So in that early, very active phase, you've got a lot of turbulence and, and all of this activity that we're talking about making a thick disk. So it is like two galaxies, but it is, it's, I think it's just keyed by the very large difference in star formation rates from the first billion years compared to the last you know, 10 billion years. So one is on top of the other. And once you make the stars that you know, they never cool down, they're, they're gonna stay at that thick disk. They're gonna be the high alpha because that's the first a gig a year. They're gonna be low metals because that's the first gig a year. All they can do is move radially. And maybe you, in some galaxies, you get something like a classical bulge. And, and it looks like I'm learning today. You, you don't get that very often, but okay. And then, and then all the cool settling afterwards forms the thing that's bright today because it's younger. So I, I agree, it looks like two galaxies, but it's a natural timing sequence that we see in other ways too. Yes, but the, the, what is curious is the dichotomy between these two phases, uh, there was a, a kind of a gap. Uh, it has been, I think Victor, it was part of a paper in which uh, they were arguing for, uh, for, for uh, a mechanism to have the dichotomy. There are two or three, different ideas as to how uh, the dichotomy could arise. One, for example, was that uh, uh, the, the alpha rich uh, component uh, had to form quickly, so not to leave time to type one A's to, to, to blow out. And, uh, and so this was associated, uh, uh, I don't remember the first name of uh, the first author of the paper, uh, was associated with star formation rate in clumps. Sorry? Clark et al. Oh, yes, the Clark et al. In clumps, uh, as opposed to the alpha poor that would form uh, more quiescently in the, the, in the general disk, for example. But there are other ideas as to have uh, really a, a phase, uh, an early phase uh, which formed uh, the thick disk, then no star formation at all, but type 1A in reaching the interstellar medium, which was not forming star for a while, and then uh, uh, re resumed and to form the thin disk, which is uh, alpha core. But um, there are possibly other ideas, but that I think is critical to the history of the Milky Way to understand the sharp dichotomy between the alpha rich and the alpha poor components in the galaxy. Yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't thought of that as if the thick disk phase was quenched somehow. And then and then the settling of a, a cooler gas came in. You can, you can predict that high redshift disks, these red disks that look pretty settled even now, but at high redshift, they should have a very high alpha enrichment. Even the thin part should have a high alpha because everything there happened within the giga year when the alpha is still high. Um, the other thing course. is that uh, the globular clusters are all alpha rich. Yeah. Even the most metal rich globular clusters. Yeah. They, none of them belongs to the thin disk. Yeah, well, I mean, there are superstar clusters now that are just as massive, but yeah, I, 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 yeah the ones in the halo. Classical right. globulars. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. Okay, so. Well, could, could well be a quenching of the thick disk. I never thought of that. It might be interesting to follow that. Um, okay, I apologize for the two people with their hands up. I think I'll take the chair prerogative to just make sure we can touch on the topic that we want to touch, also to involve the people who look at the intermediate and high redshift, and it's to come back to this question of the clumps that was a bit a little bit discussed in this morning session. Um, so to make it in a sense a provocative statement, I'll just say, you know, the question is do the clumps really deserve all the attention that they're getting? So that's a provocative statement. And the reason I mention is because in Steinwald's review talk yesterday, he made the point, that although they're very bright in the light, partially in the UV and the blue, uh, they don't contribute that much to actually the stellar mass, which is what ultimately matters. I got slightly conflicting impressions from the talk by Anita Zanella and Go Yicheng today. So maybe other people can jump in. And really the question is, do they really make a large contribution to the to the stellar mass budget, or are they just bright fireworks? So please raise your hand. Uh, 
Bruce, you had your hands up, but I'll ask Anita first since she was one of the speakers and then I'll go with you second. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, I agree. That's a good question. It seems from, from now that they make quite a little contribution in terms of stellar mass. But I think the next point is really try to see what's the molecular gas content of these clumps, because that also is an important ingredient, I guess, in uh, both in clumps lifetime, uh, but also in bulge formation. And from some preliminary studies that we're doing, it seems that it's quite difficult to detect the clumps in, uh, in molecular gas. It's not clear whether the sensitivity and the resolution of the observations is enough currently. So I think this should deserve a bit more attention uh, as well. So the molecular gas content, not only the stellar mass. Thank you very much, Anita. Bruce? Yeah, I was gonna say, I think our eyes are drawn to the clumps as things, but really what would drive the torquing is all the non-axisymmetric structure that's there. And it's not just clumps. It, these are very irregular galaxies. Um, so you get torques from any kind of irregularity. And as someone, I think Sten said yesterday, it's not important what a particular clump does. It's just the mass fraction that's non-axisymmetric that's driving these uh, radial flows and torques. Um, clumps can come and go, they can last long. As long as on average, you, the galaxy you're looking at over one or two giga year period is highly non-axisymmetric, it should have fairly significant uh, radial evolution of some sort. But, but yes, our eyes are drawn to the clumps and it is a fair question of what they do and what their masses are. They're the obvious non-axisymmetric parts, but the whole disk is pretty messy too. Yeah, thank you, uh, Bruce. Of course, it's also true that because they're so bright, the disk may look more asymmetric than they really are uh, when you look at the actual mass distribution. Uh, Victoria, have your hand up. Yeah, the other thing about clumps is, uh, well, two, two factors that make them important. One is that they have high star formation rates and they produce a lot of stars. Uh, and some of those stars are, are being stripped out of the clumps themselves. So what you see is not necessarily all that ever was born in a clump. Uh, and the other point is, well, one of the other things that the clumps do for you is they're very efficient at scattering things. Uh, they're massive. Uh, and so they'll perfectly ha happily scatter stars into a thick disk. So I think that's an important fact, right? I mean, if, if, if that provides any explanation for any fraction of the thick disk, that's important. Thank you, Mirka. Yes. Um, yeah, just to react to maybe, um, I don't think because the clumps globally do not have a high contribution of, uh, in mass, at the time we see them, that doesn't mean that they don't contribute to the buildup of the galaxy. Because I think they still are transient structures. They don't have giga years of ages and certainly there are star clusters that are continuously formed over the whole galaxy lifetime. And they slowly contribute to the stellar mass buildup of these galaxies at high redshift. And uh, we do see uh, from the molecular gas, as I would talk on Friday, that um, maybe we have some hint of possible much higher star formation efficiency at the molecular cloud, cloud scale at these high redshift galaxies. And that would be something very important because we know that all these stellar clusters are forming from molecular clouds also in local galaxies. So um, uh, I would say that they certainly contribute to the global mass buildup of galaxy, but uh, I'm more reluctant to think that they contribute to the bulge formation because there are also some simulation from Lucio Mayer and uh, Valentina Tomberello, where they see the formation of these clumps while there is already the presence of a, a pseudo bulge in this galaxy during the fragmentation process. So this pseudo bulge seems to be already in place while we still see some uh, cloud formation which is going on. Okay, thank you. Perhaps uh, quickly, Yi Cheng. Yeah, I think uh, uh, Mirka and uh, Bruce and also Anita, they have uh, very good poems about uh, clumps. And here I just want to mention uh, extra point. It's a little bit uh, of the topic of this uh, conference, but uh, I think it's a still an important topic for clumps. So that's to use clumps to, uh, to test uh, the feedback models. 
And uh, that's why I, I mentioned that in my talk, because we do see those clamps in, um, in galaxies, high redshift galaxies. Uh, you can see we see them in UV or rest uh, optical. So um, then can we see them in simulations? And the uh, big issue of simulations is uh, uh, they try to match the stellar mass and the halo mass relation. And that was a big issue uh, several years ago. And uh, almost all people overestimated the stellar mass at a given halo mass. So what they can do is they add a, a bunch of uh, very strong feedback so they can reduce the star formation at early time and reduce the star formation rate by a lot. So they can match a stellar mass, halo mass relation. But the price you paid for that is uh, you also smooth out or smeared all the substructures of galaxies. So the, all the galaxies you make is very smooth. Um, for example, fire simulation. And uh, um, that's a signal that you include too much or too strong feedback. So um, clamp, I think is a test. So you have to have a strong enough feedback to match uh, star formation rate and uh, stellar mass relation, but you cannot have too much of that to totally destroy the substructures of galaxies. Thank you very much, Yicheng. Very good point about using the clumps as a laboratory, essentially. Um, so uh, I'm afraid we're, we're running out of time, so I think it's, it's time to wrap up. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Ludovico, my co-chair, of course, all the panelists, so the uh, invited speakers as well, all contributed speakers, both for their participation in this discussion, but of course also for their marvelous talks. Uh, I suspect Francesca will want to say a few words, but I remind you that now everybody's mission is to listen to another batch of talks that are already online, if you haven't done so already, to be ready for the next discussion session and invited talks on Friday. Um, Francesca, Dimitri, would you like to say something else? Um, I don't know if I'm just going to say something, but yes, I think you pretty much summarized everything. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone. It's been uh, a long day for, for many of us. So tomorrow you have to, uh, to watch an, another bunch of uh, contributed talks, but then we meet again on Friday for more discussion on Borges. Thanks to the two excellent chairs of the session. Yes, exactly. Thanks a lot. The recordings for this session will be available, I think, tomorrow morning. So if some of you is interested to hear back some points that might have missed. Morning um, Central European time. Morning Central European time, yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 I don't know, you want to stop the recording? Ah.